Welcome to Insights and Sound, where we talk to the people behind the scenes, behind the technology, and behind the music. People you may not know, but you should. And please check out getitinwriting.net forward slash shows for a full list of our podcasts and YouTube series. My guest is Steve Savanyu. He is the proprietor and founder of Buford T. Hedgehog Productions. The T, I believe, stands for the? The T stands for the. Ah, of course. Steve's got a pretty interesting history. Most people know you as the AT guy. Uh, and, 21 yeah. years with Audio Technica, and I did a lot of marketing-related stuff and product management, um, educational services, you know, training things, and trade show events. So I was always at trade show events, and that's where I met most of everybody I know in the industry. One thing that uh, was sort of near and dear to me was um, we were both doing artist relations for competing companies for a while, and um, I will say that I have a lot of respect for artist relations people who don't try and make it all about them. And that was one of the things that you and I both had in common was uh, I think we're not really in a whole lot of photos posing with rock stars. No. no because you know, it's not about that. It's not about that. I, I, I totally agree. And I think a lot of people think that's what it's all about. It's like, oh boy. And, you know, I have, I tell people I have done projects with popes and presidents and you know it's just it's another day at the at the gig as they say mm -hmm. yeah yeah and i think that's what's important to to realize is that we are in the service of creating content creating art yeah and that's what all this gear is all about oh of course so let's start with a little bit of your history um what i think is interesting you're, you're not necessarily a musician per se Right? I mean, you've got some musical background, I know. I have but... a little bit of musical background. I, I'm a wannabe drummer, so mm -hmm. I own a drum set. Uh, I played trombone in junior high school and hated it. I, I always tell the story that I was a, you know, the budding young trombone player, and all of the other budding young trombone players had the really cool, brand new Selmer School rental instrument. And my father knew a guy that played in some jazz band that had a, an old trombone that, oh, this will be fine. Why spend the 20 bucks a month for the rental piece? And I had this old ratty looking, was probably a fantastic was horn. I was going to say, it was probably way cooler than any of those rental <laughs> but, Selmers. But, yeah. but, you know, but, as, yeah. as a little kid, you know, you wanted the new da 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 da. Yeah. And yeah, I didn't, you know, and they, of course, when we went to the music store to find out what instrument I should play, the guy running the music store in cahoots with the band director at the school said, well, we need trombone players. Of course. <laughs> of course. You well, look like a trombone player. Oh, you've mm -hmm. got the mouth for a trombone. Right. Okay. Uh -huh. The teeth uh -huh. for a trombone. That's what <laughs> your teeth are perfect for the trombone mouthpiece. Well, it's interesting because they did use that argument a lot with, you know, to try and steer people from either woodwinds to brass or the other way around, you know, well, it's your teeth, you know. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You've got an overbite. You shouldn't play the clarinet. Right, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You've got the perfect, you know, your teeth are perfectly aligned for the, for the horn. Right. It's like, okay. So, so was that, I mean, obviously you got into technical stuff early. I got into technical stuff. You're like I, on the AV squad or something? Well, or? you know, I got into technical stuff when I was in like elementary school. And I was the kid that got to hook the old woolen sack, big steel tape recorder up and flip a little switch on the back that would make it a PA system. Mm. And every year they'd have, I remember this vividly, they would have an Arbor Day <laughs> thing outdoor you know in some part of the elementary school yard and we'd run a long extension cord out and set this tape recorder up and plug its microphone in and flip the little switch and it became a PA system Ooh. and that was my first foray into doing it. and I like doing that kind of stuff mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. always been into electricity and always been into uh, uh, the technical side I like to take things apart and you know as a little kid I would when they had the spring cleanup, I would be on my bicycle finding old TVs and radios and taking the speakers out of them and going, look. Of course. Yeah. You know, I, I think all, all my friends did that. Yep. And, 
Yeah. And so I was always the the technical guy. I was never a sports guy. Mm-hmm. Even though my father was big time into sports, I was never really a sports guy. Yeah. I, I understand all too well. Mm-hmm. We, we were the dorky kids who liked to take things apart. And stuff. Yeah, it yeah. was fun taking yeah, things apart. Absolutely. And absolutely. I could put them back together for the most part. W- without parts left over? Well, there was always a couple parts left that over. That was my thing. There were insignificant yeah. parts. At least I thought so. Well, yeah. I always thought they were insignificant until I fired it up and it didn't work again. But yes. you know, that's another story. Anyway, so tell us a little bit about the career development path, because obviously it was also a little bit convoluted. It was very convoluted. I, I grew up in Northeast Ohio. I went to college for four years at Kent State University and Youngstown State University. Got a degree in electronic engineering, but I really didn't want to learn about power and motors. and I really wanted to be in the audio world. And I would dabble in audio systems and play with sound systems, and I would do sound for friends' bands. I had a old Bogan amplifier and a couple of microphones and what more do you need? Homemade speakers and mm-hmm. uh, and I hooked that up and you know this is back when you know bands had that was the PA you know that's tr- right trumpet speakers you know and nothing went through the PA except the vocal except the vocal that's right and and they were awful sounding because it you know. Aging horns. That's but it didn't think. matter because we were awful sounding. And exactly. It didn't matter because we were all going to be the next Beatles. All going to be the next Beatles. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so I graduated from college and started my own business. I was a, um, did a lot of different things. Um, Audio visual repair. Um, I did scoreboard repair because my father was big into athletics. I did sound system installs in schools and churches and all that whole contractor kind of thing. And kind of liked it. And then on the sideline, I was building uh, a sound system for doing bands. And, you know, back in the days, you know, today we take it, you know, we take it for granted. We go to the, you know, the big box music retailer or online or, you know, you go to, I'll mention a couple of brand names, Sweetwater or Full Compass or those kind of guys. And, um, you know, I need a hundred foot 16 channel audio snake. And, you know, you, know, you order one of those from Proco or which Rapto these or, days is probably a Cat Six cable, but yeah, that's another story. That's yeah. another story, yeah. but you know what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. But back in in the early days, you built all of that. Absolutely. And I built many of a lot of gear. I built speaker cabinets. We built you know mm-hmm. amp racks, and we put it all together. And you learn by doing. You and do. You do soldering XLR cables. Soldering and all XLR that cables, and uh, yep. I still to this day, it's a relaxing afternoon is repairing the broken mic cables. And, mm-hmm. you know, I understand. Yeah. So, but Which makes me a geek too, but that's another story. <laughs> uh-huh. So, you know, I started doing all that kind of work. And the, the funny thing is, is, you know, when you've got a father that's big time into athletics who has no idea what you do, um, you know, all of a sudden opportunities come along to prove what you do is valuable. And the one that comes to mind is um, the Northeast Ohio was the hotbed for high school football. Every little high school in Northeast Ohio had their own football stadium. And oftentimes these were built by uh, volunteers and, and so on. And I would be the guy that would go in and help get the electrical stuff going and, and work with the scoreboards and that. And I was the scoreboard repairman. And mm-hmm. there'd be many times the first weekend in September, I'd be on a ladder while they're playing the national anthem, taking a clock back out of a scoreboard <laughs> because the game has to start in 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah. But the story that comes to mind is... At the end of the football season, they would have this big kind of a sort of Heisman Trophy type event called the uh, Trumbull County Coaches Annual Player of the Year Awards Banquet. And it was a two-part event. During the day, they would bring in all of these college coaches and all of the high school coaches would you know, gather up all their game films. And this is back when game films were real film. Mm. And, the, and believe it or not, coaches were really good film editors. Really? They were good film editors because they were taking all of the game films and they were editing them all together to get highlight reels of their key yeah, players. Of course. So they were looking all, for those little those little nuggets. Yeah. They all mm-hmm. knew how to use a film splicer and they all knew how to edit film, 16 millimeter silent film. And so during the day of this event, it was held in a restaurant. Uh, they set up the high school, you know, 15 high schools. Set their the coaches set their big projectors up down in this basement banquet room, and um, they'd plug these projectors into the wall outlets and try and all show their 
highlight reels at the same time. Oh. Well, each of these projectors had a thousand watt light bulb in it. And, yep. You know, all of the little outlets they were plugging into. I see into where this is going. Uh-huh. <laughs> were for the uh, decorative uh, paintings with a little light above them. Right, right. And, uh, you know, they'd turn the first one on and be fine. They'd turn the second one on and it would work. And they'd turn the third one on and a breaker would Poof. go somewhere. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they had no idea how to fix this problem. And, you know, they tried running extension cords to, yeah, I just couldn't get it. They couldn't get more than like three projectors. Oh, you're just running an extension cord to a different circuit and blowing that one. Yeah. Blowing that one. So mm-hmm. my father comes to me and he goes, son, I don't know what you do, but maybe you can help us with this problem. <laughs> and I said, I get down and I, lo- and I knew exactly what the problem was. So I went back to my shop and pulled my, I built a power distribution system for my PA system for my sound company. And, uh, Ran the stage stringers out along the perimeter of the room and big Hubble twist locks on it and put the distro panel back in the corner somewhere and ran the feeder cable to the main breaker box in the restaurant and tapped in just like I was at a gig. I love it. And told the coaches, plug your projectors into the outlets on the floor, not the ones on the wall. And they ran all 15 projectors the entire afternoon and never had a problem. Of course, you could have just told them, turn them on one at a time, but that would have been far too restrictive. That would have been far too restrictive. Yes, understood. Because they all had to show off their, they're all vying for the. Absolutely. So that night at the big banquet, unbeknownst to me, they uh, came out and they said, before we give the the Player of the Year award, we have a special award that uh, goes to a guy who's a coach in his own way. And they made me an honorary lifetime member of the Trumbull County Coaches Association. In the entire evening, they all called me coach, and my father was just beating. Oh, I love it. So, I love it. So, you know, I was applying what I knew in my world to mm-hmm. something that was totally foreign to those guys, and it actually worked out really well. It's kind of cool to be able to show off to your, to your folks like that, too, yeah. you know. Yeah, and they were, they were very supportive, I have to admit. They, uh, um, you know, here's this young kid just out of college trying to do his thing, and they didn't really understand the live sound part of what I was doing, and I booked about... 12 shows with uh, the number one folk acts in Cleveland. I was doing all the folk music guys because my sound system was clean. Mm -hmm. Didn't have all the buzzes and hums that everybody else's homemade PA of the 1970s had. And of course, when you have acoustic instruments and vocals and that's it, those buzzes are going to be be, very prominent. You can't blame it on the electric guitar player. Yeah. And uh, so I booked uh, like 16 gigs with this this guy and I needed a, a big power amp for the the PA and my parents said go buy the power amp and don't worry about it we'll pay for it nice. so they're really supportive it was really nice. kind of neat the other thing I think that says something nice about your parents and their support is your kid is just out of college it's not just that he's doing something you don't understand but you're starting your own business yeah and starting your own business is that's a scary proposition at any time but I think more people do it now whereas you know 20 30 years ago people didn't necessarily venture mm-hmm. into starting their own businesses no. as, as often as they went to work for somebody else. So that's a, that's a brave step. Yeah, it was a brave step. And, and I, I did that for a number of years. And then, like I said, in 1979, the economy in Northeast Ohio basically tanked and I, I watched everything just dry up. And um, at that point, I thought, okay, it's time to get a real job. And uh, I got a job with a company called Kitta Automated Systems. And probably most people know Kitta for the fire alarms and fire extinguishers. Ah, those guys. Those sure. guys, K-I-D-D-E. Uh-huh. Yeah. And they had a facility in Westlake, Ohio. And I started as an estimator, estimating sound systems. And we when did... When you say sound systems, how does that tie into fire extinguishers? Are we talking about emergency systems for evacuating buildings and Emergency stuff? Emergency systems for evacuating. Okay. So okay. Mm-hmm. Kitta, along with the fire extinguishers and, and halon suppression systems and all that kind of stuff, also did a lot of highly secure projects like power plants and uh, nuclear facilities and, and DOD facilities and da 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 mm-hmm. And a lot of those needed paging systems and needed warning systems and needed, okay. you know, I, I've I have spec'd everything from, you know, 8-inch ceiling speakers to the big yellow air raid sirens. I started out in the domestic estimating department, and they would get requests for bids from international clients, mainly in the Middle East. And nobody in the domestic estimating department wanted to 
do those projects because there was never enough information in their minds mm. to estimate one of these projects. And me being the new guy, I kind of got stuck with them. Uh, that got me involved in the international world. So here I am in my you know early to mid-20s, and I'm now designing and uh, commissioning projects around the world. And I actually designed and uh, the electronic systems for an underground command center, which I'd come to find out later on in my life was used by General Schwarzkopf in the Desert Shield War. Love it. And uh, I... Storm and uh, Norman. I mm -hmm. uh, um, did this project, and it came in under budget and on time, and I went there three times to commission it. So this would have been, what, 70s, 80s? This would be early 80s. Okay. I mean, like 1983, 84, 85. Okay. I think uh -huh. it was in 85 I was doing the commissioning on this thing. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> so if you've ever seen the movie War Games, you know, the generals sit behind the big windows and they look down and there's like this little room where there's all these like guys working on these counters and consoles and the big screens with the world maps and all that kind of business on the mm -hmm. walls. And, uh, well, I designed and built one of those. Cool. Okay. And... This is back in the days, you know, we take for granted the technology that we have today, right? You know, the, the camera, the camera in this thing is way better than any video camera that we had sure, in the of 1980s, course. right? Of course. So we're dealing with three tube TV cameras, broadcast mm -hmm. TV cameras in this command center. So we had to commission these. And they required a... Um, Four trace storage oscilloscope piece of test equipment it was built by a company called Tektronics, and it was brand new. I mean, this was just at the beginning of storage type devices, and we and that's what the manufacturer of these cameras said was required to set them up. And the setup process. I mean, now you just turn your camera on and you turned your cameras on this morning. You focused. You set the iris, and away we went. Well, with these TV cameras, you had to. You know, set up a bunch of parameters. Sure, and, all yeah, manually done. All manually done. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, the cables on those cameras in those days were about the size of my arm. Right. With mm -hmm. like 85 pins in some giant connector. And mm -hmm. So we rent. We would, we would rent equipment all the time from this rental house, and they'd come in a big anvil padded road case, and we'd check it as luggage on the plane, fly over to wherever we're going, use it, bring it back, and we never you know, say anything about it. So we rent this thing, and it's so new, they haven't built the big road case for it, so the sales guy from the test equipment company just comes over and delivers it naked. It's got a little vinyl pouch cover with a little thing on the side to hold all the probes and wires. Here you go. So we got to now carry this thing over to this job in the Middle East. So we uh, fly from Cleveland to New York. We get to... JFK, and in those days, you claimed your baggage in domestic, took the shuttle over to the international terminal, and then you rechecked in with your international airline. JFK, we get to the Copenhagen Airlines, Scandinavian Airlines counter, and the little guy at the counter goes, sorry, sir, one carry-on per person. And I said, well, this is a really expensive piece of equipment that we really can't check as baggage because there's no way it's not protected, it's going to get destroyed. And there's no way I'm going to check my little bag because it's got the important stuff in it like my Walkman and cassette tapes. Mm -hmm. Sorry, sir, one carry on per person. So we kind of argue with this guy, and this is one of the few times when I wore a wristwatch. I'm like looking at my watch and we're going to miss our flight because of this guy. And, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to, we're, you know, can we just, you know, make an exception, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. So he finally goes back and he talks to the supervisor. You can see him back there talking and supervisor walks over and he says, I kid you not. He says, doctor, is it okay if the kidney machine rides in the cockpit behind the co-pilot? Nice. Okay. And I said, I looked at my assistant and I said, doctor, is it safe for the kidney machine to ride in the cockpit behind the co-pilot? And my assistant without batting an eye goes, I concur. There you go. And they hand carry <laughs> this thing, and it flies behind the co-pilot. We actually, they actually showed us where they put it. Hey. And so we, we get to uh, 
get to Copenhagen, and now we've got to go through customs and all that business. And the airline guy comes up to us and goes, Doctor, uh, do you, is it okay if uh, the airline holds your kidney machine uh, while you're enjoying the weekend in Copenhagen? And Any problems with that? And I turned to my assistant and said, okay, if the airline holds the kitty machine while we're in COVID, I concur. As long as you get it back, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. we get back the next day and, oh, kitty machine's going to fly in the cockpit. Be okay. So we get to Saudi Arabia and now we're going through customs. Uh-oh. And, you know, everything to declare? No, nothing really. And, you know, and what's this? Uh, yeah, doctor, obviously he's never seen a kitty machine before. I concur. Oh, sorry, doctor. No problem. Right on through. Nice. So we get to the job site, and now this thing has kind of taken on a life of its own. Mm -hmm. We are right. calling it's it the kidney, kidney machine. machine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, we worked for a Korean. We were subbed to a Korean contractor, and our liaison person was I want to say it was Mr. Park or Mr. Kim, and Mr. Park we need the kidney machine, and they had assistants that would just kind of get things and you know blah blah blah. We were setting the stuff up. We need the kitty machine. We're doing cameras in room three. Okay, we need the kitty machine. After about three days, Mr. Park comes up to me and he goes, Mr. Steve, I have one question for you. Yes, Mr. Park? Why do you use a kidney machine to set up TV cameras? And my <laughs> sister was standing behind me and I said, Mr. Park, it is a long story. And my assistant, without batting an eye, goes, I concur. Nice. Let's fast forward to... Um I'm fascinated as to how this then evolved into an audio career. That was the thing that I was kind of learning on my own as I was doing all this industrial stuff. Uh -huh. You know, and the industrial stuff always looked good because, oh, you're doing industrial stuff. You're right. not one of those musician guys. Uh, Let's move on from there. Um, how did what, what was the next gig, and how did this all turn into a, an audio gig? Well, so I left Kidda because the, the Mideast heated up politically. Mm. And uh, they were hijacking airplanes and stuff. And Really? And, I yeah. hadn't heard. Yeah. Mm. And, you know, I'm in Saudi Arabia. I'm getting, we had to check in by telex every day. Uh-huh. And, you know, and I'm, it was, got a little scary. So I said, you know, I just don't want to do this anymore. And we had done a very large project using a lot of Duquesne professional audio equipment. Mm -hmm. Back in the 60s and early 70s, Duquesne Corporation, believe it or not, they were huge. Pro Audio, them mm -hmm. and Altec Lansing. Yep. Yep. And I did a did a project that basically kept Altec Lansing alive for a year. Uh, right before they kind of went belly up. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were hand building product to to meet the needs of this project that we were doing. And um, so I Duquesne was liking the fact that I was selling a lot of their equipment. And they were looking for guys to be spec writers and designers of their sound systems using their product. And I went to work for them. Uh -huh. And I moved to the Chicago area and uh, nice little suburbs and liked it out there. And um, that's how that became to be. And I was now doing pro audio, which was really evolved into school intercoms and nurses calls. Right. Duquesne in particular, they were... it. it it was referred to as pro audio. I, I think it was institutional audio. It was more institutional yes. audio. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason why is they had the opportunity to become a real name in the music industry. Mm -hmm. But the owner of the company was a big opera fan and hated rock and roll. So Awesome. Yep. That was mm -hmm. my ex-father-in-law, but it's in a whole other ah, ah, world. I see. Yeah, so you, you got deeply involved in Duquesne. I got deeply involved in Duquesne. and In a uh, familial sense. Yes. Uh -huh. And I did some fun stuff with Duquesne and was still in that institutional audio thing. In the meantime, I had a sound company going in the background, doing little local things and doing some local recording and was starting to build a little digital recording rig. And this is when the DAT machines were coming into play. Oh, yeah. And, yep. Yeah, and all of that technology. And... Started getting into more production-oriented things as a sideline because I really didn't like industrial audio. Mm -hmm. You know, no offense to the guys that no, it's do just, all it's, that stuff. It's, it's not all that creative, and no. the content that you're, you know, the thing is, we do a lot of this in the service of the art, and if you're creating content that you love, yes, you'll overlook a lot. That's why a lot of people worked in recording studios back then. Yes. Whereas if you're putting in systems for high school auditoriums mm -hmm. and whatnot, 
the content is not necessarily, or at least back then in particular, it was not necessarily inspiring. No, you know, it was going to be for the school play or for the school assemblies, and yeah, and and you know, unless you were in the the big install companies that did the, you know, the big performing arts centers and the big music halls and the, those kind of things, right? You were pretty much doing you know a couple of fifteen inch boxes and a couple of you know exactly cell horns and. For A7s somebody who would and, who would basically go, dum, dum, dum. is yeah. this on? Is yeah yeah, yeah and exactly. Then, and then they'd cup the mic and it would feedback. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, so but I did that. It was you know, I enjoyed it and um, good experience. Good experience. Mm -hmm. I was there for like fifteen years. Wow. And then I decided again to go on my own, and I was doing more video production work and uh, creating training videos and things, and left Duquesne. Um, was married and got divorced. Of course, when you're the ex yeah. spouse of the uh, of the owners, the job goes away the with job the marriage. Goes away mm. with the marriage. <laughs> uh -huh. And uh, um, but you know, it was it was a good rela I mean, even up, up till the end, it was a good relationship. And uh, basically, uh, started my own production company and was doing okay. Uh, did a lot of medical videos, which were interesting, and. Then the digital video revolution hit. And all of a sudden, the clients just kind of disappeared because mm -hmm. they could hire, bring in a guy in just out of college that had some video experience, buy a Canon XL1 video camera and a Mac yep. computer, and they were now doing video production. And at that point, I wanted to get back into, I wanted to get back to Ohio because my Family was getting up in the years, and you know the eight-hour drive back and forth to Chicago was a, not not a pleasant thing. Sure. And I looked at um, looked at Sure microphones to go work for Sure, and I happened to know it was a dear friend uh, and was my mentor and boss at Duquesne, Sandy Lamantia. Ah, good old Sandy. Good old Sandy. Uh huh. Sandy Lamantia, wonderful yeah, fellow, fantastic guy. Um, he sanctioned my. Uh, my tenure as Artist Relations Europe. Okay. He absolutely loved what I was doing there as well. Yeah, he was a, he was a good guy. He was, yes. He was mm -hmm. my, he, one of my mentors. Mm -hmm. And um, so I basically uh, applied at Shure, and they offered me a position, but they wouldn't cover any kind of relocation expenses because I was within Chicagoland. And it was going to be an hour and 10-minute commute each way. No easy way to get from where I lived to, to Evanston. Mm -hmm. Evanston. Yes. And, you know, and in the meantime, Audio Technica was also looking for somebody. And I applied there, and they came back with a nice offer, and they were going to cover a move to back to Ohio. And basically um, came back here and started working for Audio Technica. And mm -hmm. I was in industrial sound, so I did all the unipoints and all of that kind of stuff. Mm hmm. Not really what I wanted to do, but it was still fun. I was in, starting to get my toes into the music industry side of things. Uh -huh. Sit, vowed I would never own a sound company again. Huh. <laughs> of course not. Of course not. No, no. And then I started doing stuff um, as a sideline with a guy named Ken Reichel. Mm -hmm. And we were doing some little concert things, and I started just cobbling together bits and pieces. And... Um, I actually bought some Mackie powered speakers. They weren't the four fifties or whatever the, everybody was buying. There were some bigger ones, mm -hmm. and did a couple of concerts with them. And there was actually a magazine article written on. And lo and behold, you're back in the sound business. Back in the sound business, mm -hmm. and I yep. started building the PA stuff. Funny how that happens, huh? And you know, went through all the analog stuff, and then I started. I found a niche, and which was community festivals. Mm -hmm. So three or four stages, and but not big stages, you know, and thus the inventory of three hundred microphones and <laughs> five hundred mic cables, and mm -hmm. still remnants of that. I've gotten rid of a lot of it because I've downsized it. But mm -hmm. um, so I started to get into doing that, and I was getting involved in the musical side of AT as well, on the creative side, doing videos and training pieces and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. So I got to AT, mm -hmm. and I. And you were doing you 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 had already mentioned that you were working on a lot of their marketing content. Well, and, you know, I was yeah. doing I was a marketing manager for the installed sound, mm. and like at Duquesne, 
and others, they found out I could teach. Mm. And next thing you know, I'm doing all this training content creation and training materials for new product introductions and dealer training and more so uh, end user training. And they, I, you know, I, even though I was a marketing guy for whatever the product lines were, I ended up doing all this training stuff. And finally, they came to me and said, look, we want to make you the training manager. And I had been, they'd done that once before and it just didn't kind of work out. And I told them, no, I don't really want to do that unless, and my boss at the time, who was a really good guy, said, what do you mean? I said, well, I would like a director level title and um, a little bit more of that kind of, you know, that kind of stuff. And he said, why? I said, because when I go out to say a school, going in as the director of educational services, as opposed to the training manager at Audio Technica, yes, it, all of a sudden gives AT and me more credibility. Mm -hmm. And the other thing we learned, and I had known this, is a lot of schools don't want manufacturer training people to come in because it's normally a sales guy. Yep. And the, they want educational material that's going to educate their students on the concepts of the products that the manufacturer makes. They don't want a sales pitch. Right, right. And that was one of the things that in all the training stuff I did, I never, someone would say, well, how much was that microphone? I have yeah, no yeah. idea. Let's... You have to be price and brand agnostic in order to come across as an educator rather yes. than a salesperson. Correct. A marketing person. And mm -hmm. that's what made it work. And be, being the director of educational services, and mm -hmm. I made up the whole title, mm -hmm. um, now all of a sudden gave it some credibility. And it wasn't, you know, oh, you're the training manager. And that oftentimes meant you're a sales guy because yeah. most of the training managers at other companies were sales guys. Yeah. So they gave me an office suite and I had a training room attached to it and I could bring people in, but I found I was better off to go to their locations. Sure. So I'm going to recording schools and I'm going to SBE meetings and uh, AES groups and so on. That's a great segue into talking about education because, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of what we do in a lot of the audience for the show is educators and students. Yes. And one of the things that I think is important is tying it to present day. You know, we came up in an era where not only was technology different, the creative process was different. Yes. And, you know, now we have, to a certain extent, all this as you say, all this equipment at our fingertips that literally does 90% of it for us. Mm -hmm. The connections are so much easier. It's one, one cat five cable or six cable or whatever, right. as opposed to all of this technology that you really have to understand. Now there's a, there's a good and a bad aspect to that. Mm -hmm. Obviously the good aspect is it's convenient and we can get a lot done faster. Yes. However, it kind of skims over a lot of the basics and a lot of students don't learn a lot of the concepts. That's correct. That go with this. Absolutely correct. And I think that's part of the role of training students now, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, I, totally. I think the biggest challenge right now as an educator is how do you convey that basic information? Coming back to the younger people coming in who need to gain an understanding of all the basics from microphones, mm -hmm. acoustics, signal flow. They're almost overwhelmed by how much information they've got. Is it now, I think, more a process of breaking it down? Yes. Rather than starting with the fundamentals in a way. I mean, well, you, still, you still break it down to the fundamentals. You still break it down to the fundamentals. But so there's almost a barrage of information. Now. Right. Well, you yeah. know, I like the fact that some of the, the, the schools, I think Blackboard comes to mind, they start the students out and they're going to put them on a little analog mixer yep. and they're going to give them a pair of compressors. They're going to give them a, a pair of, you know, EQs or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they're going to say, okay, that's where we're going to start. Let's talk signal flow. Yeah. yeah. Let's, let's talk about how things, because once you know the basics of signal flow, 
and the basics of how to do system troubleshooting. And I don't mean component level troubleshooting. I'm meaning right, if right. you're not getting signal output flow. At, signal yeah. flow mm-hmm. troubleshooting. Yeah. If you're not getting output at the mains, but you're getting output at the monitors, what right. where's the problem? Right. Check this cable, check that connection. You know, divide right. and conquer, as I yeah. always say. Yeah. Um, the other thing is there's a lot of folks that want to be the recording engineer, you know, creating those gold records in the studio. And that's a fine, fun place to be. Studios are changing. Live sound is becoming more and more. And another part of live sound that's starting to come back again is corporate. Mm -hmm. Corporate event sound is coming back again. Because corporate event sound is like a concert in a nice air-conditioned ballroom. Mm -hmm. And the technology involved in those things is as good as, as, if not better than, the technology used in a lot of the concert tours. Of course. And... I always tell, when I start my class, I always tell people, recording is creativity, experimentation, pushing the envelope. Mm -hmm. Live sound is damage control. I don't disagree. Of course, that's, you know, it's it's a little bit... um... It's a little bit simplified. A little bit simplified. But yes, but, yes, but I'm, absolutely. I'm, you got to say, I'm a festival sound guy. Yeah, you get you get one chance with live sound. You get one chance with live sound. I'm a festival sound mm-hmm. guy. I've got five acts on my stage with 15 minutes between the acts to break down and the next guy to move in. Mm-hmm. I've got to line check that band, and I've got to get them up and running. The sound check is probably going to be their first number. No and I, I'm, going, I'm going to, the first thing I'm going to do is look at the money channels. Lead vocal. Secondary vocals, if they're important. Mm-hmm. And then critical things that have to be mic'd and amplified. Mm-hmm. The guitar player with his you know, double quad Marshall stacks and the drummer. That's not, yeah, exactly. Those are, those probably, are coming out. Those, are, those guys are going to make enough noise on the stage. Mm-hmm. I'll get to them later. It's always funny when I see the guy... Doing, I'll, I'll line check. I'll say, merely kick drum, boom, boom. Okay, snare, boom. Okay, I just want to make sure I get signal places. Mm-hmm. And half the time, it's not even coming through the PA. I'm just looking at my screen on the iPad if I'm doing mixing on the glass or the console looking at the channel meters to see that I've got signal present. Mm-hmm. And they go like, you're so fast at doing that. It's because I already know where I'm, I already know where yeah. I'm going. Yeah. yeah. And I think I've seen situations where, you know, the, the guy is, you know, trying to get that, perfect kick drum sound and it's like you're just burning your time yeah let me ask you the question that i think comes up the most which is 15 year old you coming into the industry now you've got a completely different set of priorities as we said in terms of learning by breaking things down as opposed to building them up Mm -hmm. you've got a completely different set of opportunities than you would have had years ago. And there are probably a lot of opportunities that we didn't, well, not probably, there are definitely a lot of opportunities that we didn't even know about years ago, didn't exist years ago. Mm -hmm. What do you tell a 15-year-old coming up now who wants to be in the audio industry, doesn't necessarily know where they want to be in the audio industry? What do you do now? Well, you know, everybody that I talk to at my classes Everybody wants to be the guy sitting behind that big console mixing the gold records. And there's not too many of those left. Um, Look at alternative things in the industry. And I'm going to bring up something that probably very few people talk about. And that's comms. Intercom. Mm -hmm. Intercommunications on a major show is as critical and as important as the main sound system. Absolutely. And there are very few people that do comms and do it well and those guys are in huge demand and they make good money and they travel to some really cool places and do some really cool things Mm -hmm. um so is it as glamorous as being the front of house mixer not really but it's a good solid career opportunity that gets you in the industry other thing is look at other aspects um you know learn Learn troubleshooting from the system-wide capability. Learn how to use some basic tools. Learn how to fix things. I think that's 
that's the big point right there is learn as much as you can. Learn as much as you can. And, you know, do I need to learn about big generators all the time? No, but I know enough about what the pieces and parts were to make it work that I could solve the problem. Well, and I think that comes down to the whole idea that you were talking about earlier, which is learn the big picture. Yes. Learn, and, and you know, that I think is what's so important about everything that we do. We're all doing it in service of the art, and yet there's so many different technical infrastructures that go along with it. Yes. And the more you can understand about that big picture, it may not be the job that you end up doing, but if right. you understand what everybody else's job is, if you understand how all those pieces fit together, yes. you're not only gonna do a better job for yourself, but you're gonna understand how your job interfaces with theirs. And respect the craft. Yep. Respect yep. the craft. I mean, learn a little bit about what the lighting people have to do. Learn a little bit about what the iMag people are doing, what the video people are doing on a gig. Um, learn a little bit about power. Learn what the difference is between a 15 amp circuit and a 20 amp circuit. I mean, that sounds dumb, and it's just natural to me because that's what my background is. But all so often, somebody comes up against a situation, and it's it's a simple matter of just solving the, you know solving the problem, yes. systematic troubleshooting. Yeah. Learn what to do. Learn how to use some tools. Learn the big picture, basically. Learn the big picture. Learn how all the pieces and parts kind of fit together. Do I know how to take this apart and fix it? No. But do I know how to signal flow troubleshoot through it if I don't have a output on the mains and I got output on the monitors? That tells me, well, maybe there's a cable problem between the output of the console and the main yeah. speaker system. Or yeah. wherever the next next point in the divide and conquer is the best way to do troubleshooting. Yeah. Divide and conquer and learn the big picture. Learn the big picture. Yeah. Cool. Steve Zavanyu, thank you for being my guest. Oh, it was a blast. And of all the crazies, we were dividing and conquering here this morning. Yes, we were. Hey, I'm Daniel Keller. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and join us each week for Insights and Sound.